uh, I was kind of minding my own business, praying and worshiping one night in the living room. My wife had already gone to bed, and suddenly the Lord was there. And he came over and actually sat down in the spirit. Suddenly I can see both in the spirit realm and the natural. And he said, um, he said this, he said, I want to teach you a little bit. And of course, I was born again in the charismatic renewal of the, of the 1970s, late 60s, early right. 70s. So he said this, you are a product of what you call the charismatic renewal. He said, at that time, many of my people came out of the denominational churches because their needs weren't being met. And uh, he said, and thus, uh, what you would call parachurch organization started. And you heard of prayer groups and, and Bible studies, of people meeting on their own. He said, out of that sprang up a whole new breed of churches, a whole new generation of churches. And he said, you're a product of that. And that was exactly the case. And then he said this, he said, but many of those churches have become as rigid and st structured and set on their own agenda as the denominational churches that preceded them. And once again, you're going to hear of my people leaving them because their needs aren't being met because they want more of me. That was a whole, that was, that was a little bit scary because I was a pastor of a traditional church. But he said- So he's saying there's gonna be within your mind a whole new paradigm different than what he, we've known previously. And, and you know, when he said that many of that generation, the, the, the churches that were birthed in the 70s, 80s, 90s, et cetera, have become as rigid, inflexible, and set on their own agenda as the generation that preceded them, uh, that I had to plead guilty. I was as guilty as anyone else as a pastor. You know, four songs, announcements, worship, get to the buffet line before the next church down the street. And it began birthing in me a desire to just let go and let God. That why did we have to cut off the, the worship if, if the worship was going strong and the presence of God was so strong? And so that was the, the summation of that. It started a, 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 of that first visitation was a, a real time of checking and double checking and, and comparing the way church was done in the first century and the way that church is done today all over the world. And there's a big difference. Well, briefly, what did you find? Well, oh, so many different things. The, one of the first things that I noted was that every single book in the New Testament, from Matthew to Revelation, was written to people in living rooms. There were no big buildings at the time or anything like that. Secondly, not a single letter in the New Testament uh, was written to leaders. Uh, in other words, it doesn't start and say to the elders and, and everything. The word pastor, the, the idea of the pastor being the head came about you know, 300 and some years later. It was, it was jointly governed by the people. I discovered that when I was reading uh, some of the problems, look, for instance, in the first Corinthians uh, letter, there was a situation with incest and Paul said, you should have handled it. He didn't say, get the pastor, get the elders. He said, you should have handled it. In the very next chapter, two brothers are suing one another. And he says the same thing. Instead of get the leaders or anything, he says, you should have handled it. Why don't you guys pick two of the least in the church and let them decide the issue? As a matter of fact, you talk about the whole uh, paradigm of church uh, was, was changed with Constantine. That's right. In uh, 313 AD, um, I believe it was, he issued what's called the Edict of Milan, which legalized Christianity, which brought Christians out of the homes that they'd been in for you know, more than two centuries and actually gave them a bunch of money, uh, took over pagan temples, and set up the auditorium style church that we have today. Now, I'm not against the, the church at, by any means. God will fill whatever structure uh, you know, that, that man gives him. Of course. But the very first structure that God gave him was the family. Okay, so if we want to get back what that first group of Jewish believers had, we have to do what they did according to the Bible. You had a second visitation. In February of 2001, I was about to minister in the Toronto area, and during the worship, suddenly the Lord was there, right up by the worship team, about six or seven steps away. And he came walking over to me, and one of the things he said was this, see what I see, people running to and fro to this meeting and that, looking for the spectacular, thinking that's supernatural. But they miss the supernatural work in their midst and in their heart, for the process of discipleship is supernatural. And he said some other things, and he said this, as it was in the beginning, so it must be now, I'm moving in relationships. Well, that launched about a nine or 10 month study of the Word to look at the relationships, to look more deeply at how the New Testament was actually practiced. And I found, again, that when I was reading Corinthians and Colossians and Thessalonians, that these were actually people who were named in the book of Acts 
um, who hosted these churches, Lydia in Philippi, Jason in Thessalonica. Uh, you, know, you can go down through the names, and so I was realizing I was reading real letters to real people sitting in living rooms who were in relationship, uh, deep relationship. Re deep relationship is important to God. Is that what you're saying? And relationship co accountability comes through relationship, and that's exactly right. Um, I, you know, I like to say that, that Christianity started as a relationship in Israel when God came to man. He went to Greece to become a philosophy, to Rome to become a religion, to Europe to become a tradition and part of the culture, and then to America to become an enterprise. Later that same year, in November of 2001, again I was up in Canada uh, ministering in a, a this, is, this is so important because it, it demonstrates the heart of Yeshua. Uh, it was in a church that was, that really ministered to um, the former drug addicts, prostitutes, the red light district. And in the middle of the worship service, after I had already contemplated this, in fact, a couple weeks earlier, I told my wife, I said, you know, I don't want to pastor a church again, but if I ever did, it would be in my living room, just like the Apostle Paul did. And so when the Lord appeared in this worship service and came walking over, the first thing he said as he's walking is, I love these kinds of people. And it was so important because, because that's the heart of the Lord. Uh, there are no facades on, on people who've been, been through difficulties in life and such. And he came walking over, and the power of God was so strong. And he, I don't want to say he turned it up, but the pastor next to me fell first to his knees, then flat on his face. Mm. That my strength left me, fell to my knees. And the three guys that we'd brought with us said that they saw the Lord that night and walked right, he walked right past them later. But he said, he said, you've learned much from the people I've brought across your path and your studies in the Word the last few months. Now I want you to start a house church and a house church network. And I want you to structure it in such a way to facilitate the development of house churches around the world. And I, I, said, I said, why? You know, what? And he said this. He said, it's against a time to come to resource and be a resource to them. Now this is in 2001. And so uh, a time to come, against a time to come, is, is saying that it will be a provision for a time to come. And now, of course, we have a network that, that spans the world of, of home-based churches, but the point is it's relationship-based faith. It's relationship-based Christianity, meeting people exactly where they are in life. So we're very much aware. Now, now how would this differ from, say, a, a traditional church that has uh, house groups? House churches and cell churches are two separate animals completely. Uh, a house church is completely uh, autonomous, on its own, independent, taking care of each other's needs. Um, a cell church still is attached to the larger church where the main meeting is a large congregational meeting. A house church, see we, we've discovered that Christianity is the fastest growing religion in the world according to the U.S. Center for World Missions, almost 8 percent per year. And you know we see all this stuff on the news about Islam and everything, but the fastest growing religion is Christianity mm -hmm. and it's nearly all in house church. And so one of the, the, the main differences is that people are learning that Christ lives in me and I can gather with other people and be committed to them and meet with purpose. And, and in our case, in our network, in what we believe is the Book of Acts is normal Christianity, which means it should be dynamic, it should be organic, it should be uh, full of miracles. And that's what we see happening. God meets us right there because that's the way, that's the pattern they did in the Book of Acts. Uh, you want them to provoke you to jealousy? Tell me about that meeting where the glory cloud came in. Well, you know, Sid, the supernatural happens so often, it's more a, tro it's more a matter of picking which, which one do you want to hear about. But we've had several times where, as we're sitting around in the living room and just in worship, and just not afraid of the silence, not needing to go on because we're comfortable with one another, just staying in the Father's presence. There have been so many times where we have felt, and several people have seen at the same time, this bright white fog. that just settles on people and just such peace. There's, there, when the Father ministers, there's a real depth to it. And, and I say the anointing for, for that is like an inner healing. And, and, uh, and, and His presence makes you want to be still and wait in His presence. But we've also had times where we have had several where there's been like a swirling tornado. Several people in the same house church have witnessed uh, not only a sound that they, they heard in their spiritual ears, but have seen this swirling tornado of fire, and when it touches them, all the cares and all the attacks, the, the I want to say the ramifications of the attacks that they're going through, are just swept away and burned away. 
and replace with the presence of the Lord. It's like a swirling tornado. It expands and contracts with the worship and with the presence of God. Now, the Lord told you that you were to pr start these house congregations to prepare for the times that are coming. Um, how do they help one another? I mean, we know what the Bible says, sure. but how does it work practically? Someone loses their job. Well, it, it, I'll give you great examples. You know, the book of Acts, like you said, they, they took care of one another. And what we do is the same pattern, that if that we expect the, each house church will take care of its own if there's a need. But if it's too large, if the need is too large for uh, that house church, that's when I hear about it and we appeal to the network. Very similar to the Apostle Paul going around to the Corinthian church and the Philippian church raising funds for the saints in Jerusalem. We recently had a gentleman who was involved in a car wreck, lost about six weeks worth of income. Too large for that local house church. We put it out to the network. We're able to send him over $2,200 to help out. Um, this week in Tulsa at our core house church in Tulsa. We're not having a regular church. We have a, a young family that needs a room finished out. The walls are torn out and we're uh, getting the sheetrock and the, the, the spackle and all that that's needed and we're going to finish out that room in lieu of church. Well, how do you, oh, how could you do that? <laughs> I'm kidding you, John. Uh, uh, but how, how does this differ from, say, a regular church, just smaller? You know, if a house church is a miniature of what we left, it's, it's not house church. Uh, we, we, um, we believe that the Lord is going to move through the particular gifts that are present. Paul said it this way in 1 Corinthians 14, 26. He says, how is it, brethren, when you come together, somebody's got a psalm, someone's got something that God's taught them, someone's got Yeah, but we've revelation. all been taught to be a spectator, John. It's house churches are discussion oriented, not sermon oriented. Hmm. And, and so in the relationships that develop, and often there's food, you know, if... Well, <laughs> that's the Jewish part. <laughs> that's, that's the Jewish connection right there. And so uh, a lot of the, what you see is the multi-generational, the older moms helping the younger moms, the older dads and the younger dads, and you see this happening over the food and over the worship, and it's a participatory na in nature. What we do is we ask uh, folks to consider rotating homes and rotating leadership each each week. It's you different. don't have a single leader. Don't have a single leader. It's it's mutually. So covered. we have to look to one another rather than with the one man show. Exactly, exactly. And what happens is, say say somebody is a real has an anointing and a gifting in, in music. You know when they lead and they host, it's all going to be about worship. And that's fine because that's their gifting. Somebody else who's a teacher, it's like don't even bother putting in a CD because just get out the concordance and get out the study books because it's going to be digging into the Word. It varies uh, each week. John, Jan what me. is the Lord's desire to be happening in these house congregations? That the book of Acts is normal, that there are supernatural relationships, supernatural moving of the Spirit. The gifts of the Spirit are not only the charismatic gifts. The gifts include people helping each other out, gifts of hospitality and mercy, people with mechanical experience. So everyone's a participant. Everyone Everyone's shares gifted. in the love and in, in, in the relationship. It's dynamic. It's dynamic. And, and, and the children are all part of it. Unlike the traditional church, you send your kids away and stra some stranger teaches them about Jesus. The children are all included. So we become a, a community, a family of extended aunts and uncles and, and grandparents and tossing, and tossing, that would, wouldn't be the case, tossing, handing the babies to one another or the toddlers, you know, going around uh, to one another. It's just, it's, it's rich in every area. And so, and so there's a flow of healing. There's a flow of, of love when it's done in the way that Paul practiced it. I have to ask you, does God want to heal anyone right now? Well, there's, there's healing, especially in the area of hurts and emotions right now that's going on. In fact, some of you out there are, are recognizing that you've been part of a, a system that you haven't ever felt a part of that you have felt wounded, you've been wounded and, and damaged and just feel all alone, yet you're surrounded by people. Uh, the, I'm really getting a word for, for loneliness right now, loneliness and, and sorrow and, and uh, just feeling detached. And what the Lord is letting you know is there's hope. There are believers out there. The traditional church reaches less than 20% of the population of any given town. Uh, one man who did some research said Houston, Texas, only 11% is reached by the traditional church. You may be part of that other 80% who, have, who are no longer going to church, yet you desire to be the church, to link up with others. So I want to pray for you right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask that you will bring people across their paths.